If you have a, your Bibles with you this morning, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. While you're finding your place, uh, just a couple things tonight. We have our children's Christmas program at 6. Please join us for that. Uh, next Sunday, Lord willing, in the morning service, we will have our annual Christmas cantata. Uh, for those classes impacted by the practice during the ABF hour, we will be meeting in the gym for a combined class for those classes impacted uh, by the preparation for the program next Sunday. Matthew chapter 1, we are introduced, we introduced last week a, a study, uh, a new, new book study on the book of Matthew. The theme will be on fulfillment, to be fulfilled, and we'll get to that in a moment. It was uh, 1984, uh, my wife and I were, I was in school, and we were in the south, and we uh, were getting near the end of my MDiv program, and we were praying about where the Lord would lead us. And our burden was to, um, to start a church in a college town or to pastor in a college town. And we were looking to go back north to Pennsylvania. There were several uh, places that we had in mind. One was uh, a college town where Bucknell University was. Another uh, possible thought was uh, Penn State um, University there in the middle part of the state. So there were several things just kind of floating around. We were just in the praying stages when in January of uh, 84, I received a phone call from uh, one of the deacons uh, at University Baptist Church in Clemson. And uh, they, uh, he had called, uh, representing the church there, to give me an invitation to come and preach in a couple weeks there in Clemson, South Carolina. And uh, it certainly was a college town. You know, 20,000 know, folks of the 30,000 people in that town were college students. And the other 10,000 were largely uh, the workers of the school. So it was definitely a college town. Uh, we didn't think we would be in the South, but uh, we felt we needed to at least go down and preach and honor the invitation and pray about it. Uh, that f first Sunday we went down, we had a 66 Dodge pickup truck. Uh, it was a Flintstone machine. Um, you had to manually reach your hand out to do the windshield wipers. That was a stretch, but you could do it because the motor just kind of hovered a little bit and the thing could never get up and back. So you had to do that manually. It had uh, large holes in the floorboard. You could literally see the road uh, when you were driving down the highway and that made it chilly in the winters where you needed to wrap yourself with blankets. Um, but we loved it. We named it Jezebel. So we're going to pull up in Jezebel. And as we drove the uh, 31 miles from where we were living to Clemson, uh, I was a nervous wreck. I, I couldn't eat for many, many months before I, I would preach. So I, I couldn't eat that morning. Uh, I couldn't keep it down. I was just a nervous wreck. And uh, we got there a little bit early, and we went across the 18-mile creek up onto a little hill in Pendleton, and we just sat up there, and you could see the church down below in the veil there. And I was a nervous wreck. I said, what am I doing? I think we'll just head back home. In my mind, I'm thinking, how can I escape this? And uh, we prayed there together, and we got back on Pendleton Road and came into the church. Uh, it was a little metal building, 60 feet by 120 feet. It was a gravel, a mud hole drive, parking area, um, maybe 60, 80 people. And uh, yet you would have thought it was the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. It was, you know, it was, I, was, I was a nervous wreck. And uh, we were skimping by trying to finish seminary out, and uh, I didn't really have a suit that went together, not all the pieces, um, actually none of them really related. Um, I didn't think much of it, but the platform that they had was similar in height to this, but the pulpit was smaller, and they had these three or four king seats. Remember those old churches, you have these big seats, you know, these like thrones, you know? so you kind of hide these thrones, and I didn't, know, I didn't know what throne seat to sit in before preaching, you know, I, I didn't feel very kingly at all to sit in any of them. I'm 24 years of age. Um, I'm a nervous wreck, and I get up there. I didn't know that when I stood there that you could see my shoes had massive holes in them. Uh, I had holes in the bottom. I had holes on the end. Uh, the pants weren't Watergate pants where they came up, you know, to your knees, but they probably didn't go down as far as they should. Elise always kept them clean and pressed, if possible. She was good at that. Uh, my tie probably was hanging out and it was 
probably not a very good first impression. Uh, it, it was so bad that the people after I preached got together and said, we got to take an offering and get that man a suit <laughs> and a pair of shoes. It was that bad. It was that visible. So I didn't think much about it. I wasn't too self-conscious about that. And um, so I said, I'm just going to preach and thought a good beginning would be Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So my first sermon was Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 in 1984. Uh, they would ask me to come back. I would preach five sermons, and then uh, I was uh, uh, officially voted in to be their second pastor um, on April 7th, 1984, actually my birthday, and I became their pastor. Spin forward a little bit, 2002, same month of the year, I get a phone call from Matt Olson. So Al Robinson, January 84, Matt Olson, 02, January. Uh, said, would you pray about coming out to Tri-City? And we, we were not looking to leave. We weren't looking around. We were very content where we were. Uh, but we, uh, out of courtesy, said we would pray. And uh, we would, would eventually come out and preach. And um, I was voted in uh, to be your pastor, the second pastor. <laughs> I do twos well. I don't do number ones well. I do number twos well. <laughs> Uh, the second pastor of Tri-City on my birthday, April 7th. So I'm a little nervous about this January, that third call in another installation in April of, of 2023. So I'm just kind of watching the clock. You know, the Lord has these patterns, you know. And so I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Sorry to disappoint some of you, for, but for others, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, so I'm going to preach that sermon I preached. No PowerPoints, they, were, they, they weren't invented yet. <laughs> There was no PowerPoint slides. There were, you know, I was going to get a computer a couple years later, a 286, man, a 286, right after the Commodores. I mean, 286. And we bumped it up to a 386 and a 486. Um, so this was, this is almost like Pauline preaching back then. We just took a Bible and preached. Can you imagine that without all the lights and all the dynamics of technology? So uh, on the most part of a couple editions, I, I, have, I literally have my notes here that I preached. I've added a little bit to it, but not much, not much. So uh, my first sermon uh, that I preached at UBC, my first sermon that I preached here, some of you may remember, was Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon. And I thought that would be a, a good message for families. And as Elise and I were seeking the Lord's will, we were studying that book together, and I thought, this is a good book. This is the right, right topic here. All right, Matthew chapter 1. What I'd like you to do here, um, I'm going to look at the framework of this chapter. Our, our theme for this study is entitled Fulfilled. Fulfilled. Uh, we're going to focus on two prongs on that theme, sp to be spiritually fulfilled and then to watch the scriptural fulfillment. So fulfilled, spiritually fulfilled scripturally. Uh, on the spiritual side, this book is written by Matthew. Uh, Matthew was uh, an embarrassment to his family. He was a Jew. Uh, his other name was Levi or Levi. And that means he was from the tribe of Levi. And he should have been serving in, a t in the temple or should have been serving as a teacher, uh, as a Levite in one of the synagogues in the country. He should have been serving God. God set apart one of the 12 tribes to, to serve the people by teaching and serving in the, in, in the worship of the Lord. And for whatever reason, he chose none of that. And he was attracted to, to money. Uh, he was attracted to be a, a tax collector, to be an employee of Rome, uh, to take advantage of his own countrymen. He was a skunk. He was a horrible, horrible choices. And uh, tax collectors, if you were Jews doing this, you were a traitor to your, to your people. Um, you were excommunicated. You weren't permitted in the synagogues. A tax collector was... A tax collector and a Jew was... Uh, those are mutually exclusive terms. You couldn't be both a tax collector and a Jew. Uh, later, you couldn't be a Christian and a tax collector, a publican. They're just mutually exclusive terms. You couldn't be both. You have to be one or the other. You're either a tax collector and a Jew or a Jew or a tax collector. You either were a Christian or a tax collector or a tax, collect tax collector or, or a Christian. So um, it's interesting when Matthew writes, and he's the only one that does so, in Matthew 18 he talks about church discipline and at the end of that, that little paragraph, he says, if, if the offender shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee 
as a heathen man and a publican. So, so Matthew is trying to pick the, the, the worst scoundrel you can imagine. That would be a Jew serving Rome, exploiting people for money, for personal gain, as a publican or a tax collector. So a publican's not a Republican. Maybe they're similar in ways, but a publican is a tax collector. Okay. And so he, he Matthew, writes this saying, I was a tax collector. I was an unsaved man. I was a greedy man. I was a materialistic man. I wasn't a spiritual man. I wasn't following God until Jesus intercepted me and I was then fulfilled spiritually uh, when he said, follow me, follow me. And he said, that changed my life. So when he goes to that church discipline passage and at the end of it he says, treat the person who doesn't heed the private you know, admonition and the admonition of two or three and the church, church's admonition, treat that person like an unsaved person and this category of people, like a tax collector, like I was. That's what he's saying. So he has experienced the grace of God. He, he, he's now back on track I'm sure there are some of his Jewish friends that could never forgive him for what he had done. Never forgive him. And others just stood back in awe saying, wow, his life has been changed by, by Jesus of Nazareth. So there was definitely spiritual fulfillment in the life of Matthew. When it comes to being scripturally fulfilled, we're going to see phrases like in chapter 1, verse 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled. And we're going to see over and over again the scriptures being fulfilled in this study. So the, two th the theme of fulfilled, fulfilled spiritually, fulfilled scripturally. Now as we look at this unit, verses 1 through 17, uh, let's begin in verse 1. You know, what a great start. What a great start. The book, literally in Greek, the Biblos, the Biblos. What's that sound like? The book, the Bible, the Biblos. So it starts with the book of the generation, of the generation, the Greek word for generation or genealogy here is Genesis, Genesis. So the Biblos of the Genesis. So the book of beginnings, the book of the Genesis, a, a, a fresh start, a new creation, a new point. And that this book of the Genesis, new beginnings, a new creation is of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we're going to talk about a new creation, a new starting point, something developing that's just magnificent. And this unit's going to unfold those themes. Now as we work for these 17 verses, uh, there's a lot of anomalies for a Jewish genealogy. Just so many, not even time permits us to enumerate them, but there's a lot of mystery to this unit. I'm going to get right to a mystery in a moment to illustrate what I'm saying. But uh, there's a lot of unique dim dimensions, characteristics of this, the, of this section. Uh, I just read Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So what's wrong with that? Or what would catch your eye there? What's the anomaly? The anomaly is you would have said chronologically, this is the beginning of the genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham then the son of David. Chronologically, that's how you would have ordered it. But for, for, for Matthew, he reverses the chronology right from the beginning and puts David before Abraham. So he's telling you something here, that this unit is being organized not altogether chronologically, but more theologically, with a centering point being David, the king of the United Kingdom. So he's tipping his hat in a direction he wants to go. He's putting David there in front of you in an order, theologically and not chronologically. Now let's turn to the end of the, uh, end of the unit, verse 17. So as you read through these verses, so, verse 17, all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. So a time period of 800 plus years from Abraham to King David, 800 plus years. And he says that this time period, we can wrap it around 14 generations. And then he goes from, from there, from, from David there, unto the carrying away into Babylon, are 14 
generations. And that's a time period of about whatever, you know, 400 plus years. And then he has a third bracket or a third section being described or a third unit where we have from the carrying away the exile into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. And that's a little over 500 years. So the question is, when you go back into the Old Testament, is it that nicely uh, arranged where there's just 14 generations from here to here and 14 generations to here and 14 generations this last unit? The answer is no. The answer is no. There's, there's, there's generations that have been omitted uh, in, in this presentation on purpose, uh, deliberately. There are three kings, for instance, that are in verse 8, that are, that are left out. And there's probably a reason that they are left out when it comes to Ahaziah and Joash and Amaziah. So there's deliberate omissions to make the numbers all 14s. And Matthew knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Now the question is, can we understand exactly what he's doing? Now, it's symmetrically beautiful, Aesthetically, from a literary viewpoint, 14 generations, 14 and 14, very balanced, very symmetrical. That's beautiful. Uh, maybe for mnemonic purposes, teaching devices, maybe you can do it this way. Maybe that's one of the motivations. But is there more that he's doing when he organizes these three units around 14 generations? So let's look at a couple options. What is he doing? It's on purpose. It's intentional, and he's left out generations to convey the number 14. So what does the number 14 mean to us? So we know the number 6 is the number of what or who? Man. So we have in the book of Revelation three sixes, 6, 6, 6. And John helps in the interpretation, saying this is the number of man. Okay, that really helps us. And six falls short of seven. Seven is the number for what? Usually deity, completion, fulfillment, fulfillment. So number seven, completion, fulfillment. So numbers do have some value. It's nice when the Bible indicates what that value is, like in Revelation 13 with the number 666. So as we work through this lineup of names, is there any significance to 14? Well, as you walk through the lineup of these names... David, as you walk down the verses, is the 14th name listed. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, There's some, some generations omitted, so his name would fall the 14th in the lineup. That's cool. Uh, in, in, in Jewish or in Hebrew, the Hebrew language, as well as Greek, the way you did your numbers was with letters. So if, if you wanted to write out the number one, you could use the Hebrew letter Aleph. Aleph equal one, Beth equal two, Gamel equal three, uh, D, D in Hebrew, four. Okay? So each Hebrew letter uh, had a numeric equivalent. So when you take the name David, it does have a numeric value. The letter D, I just told you, Daleth is equal to four. Uh, the middle consonant is six. And, of course, it ends with a D equals 4. So we could do this. 4 plus 6 plus 4 equals what? 14. And the Jews had a very elaborate theological study on what is called gematria. Gematria is taking the Hebrew letters and doing numeric equivalents that provided codes. Provided codes or interpretations. Very, very popular. Very, very popular. Still is for, from, for some of our Jewish friends. Uh, in the first century, in early Christian writings, this, this technique of using letters to equal numbers to convey a message was used all the time. Okay? The problem is, when I look at this, I'm asking, Matthew, are, are you that elaborate? You, you're not making any connection to gematria. You're not saying that this number 14 is the number of David uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not connecting us to anything. So now, now it's very subjective. Very subjective. And I don't want to go down there too much. <laughs> okay. There's just not enough connection 
to go the gematria direction. But 14, that, there is something significant about 14. So what is 14? 14 is two what? Two times what? <laughs> two times seven. Okay, two sevens equal 14. The number seven is the number of fulfillment, completion, okay, deity in some cases. So when you think of the number seven, what comes to your mind in Scripture? Something that's related to the number seven. And let's begin back here in verse one, the Biblos of the Genesis. So when you're being introduced to a book of the Genesis. So what, what comes to your mind when you think of the book of Genesis and the number seven? What comes to your mind? Cre seven days of creation. So two times seven, are we looking at a new creation? Hmm, that's fascinating. We have the original seven days of creation, and now Jesus Christ is being introduced as, uh, as the book of the Genesis. So is this a new creation? And is it leading somewhere? Are we talking about two sevens, two, two sequences of creation accounts? And so I say, hmm, i got to wrestle with that a little bit. i got to wrestle with that a little bit. We do have the word Genesis being introduced here. We have seven, two sevens. Okay, do I have anything that might direct me in a, a two seven, two creation week stories? And all of a sudden I go to the Gospel of John. There it is. There it is. So in the beginning was the Word. Isn't that interesting? In the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and, the, and the Word uh, was made flesh. <laughs> you know, God dwelled with us in flesh, tabernacled with us in flesh. So when you go to the book of, of, of the book of John, he too is going back to creation themes. In the beginning, just like Matthew, the, the Biblos of the Genesis, <laughs> okay, both of them are tipping their hat to a creation sequence and a new sequence. So when you study the Gospel of John, in John 1.28, you have the prophet, John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus. And he makes a declaration, Behold, this is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. So there was a day that Jesus came to the Old Testament prophet John, and said, I need to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And John says, whoa, 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 whoa. I am not worthy to even latch or unlatch your sandals. And Jesus says, I must needs be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. As a, as a man and as a Jewish man, I must obey all of the word of God to, to be that perfect sacrifice, is what he's saying, to fulfill all righteousness. Then you have in the same chapter... Chapter 1, verse 29, it says, the next day. The next day. So day one, now we have the next day would be day two. Then you sc scroll forward to chapter 1, verse 35, and it says the next day. So in chapter 1, you have one day, second day, third day. And then in chapter 1, verse 43, it says the next day, or the following day, day four. Day four. And then it goes through a little narrative. And then you come to chapter 2, 1. And the third day from the fourth day, there was a marriage. So 4 plus 3 equals 7. And then he drops off on all the day talk. So why is John deliberately giving you seven days in his opening mark, remarks in, 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 in his gospel? He is talking about a new beginning seen here in baptism, which leads to a marriage union. Very interesting themes. Very interesting themes. So in the beginning was the word. So he's introducing some motifs on Genesis, on creation, on seven days. And he's talking about a new creation. If any man be in Christ, Paul writes, he's a new creature. Literally a new creation. So in John's gospel, there is no doubt a, a seven-day crea new creation week being presented here. Where here is Jesus who's come to this earth, who's going to die and fulfill the scriptures and will be raised from the grave so that you can be given eternal life for the forgiveness of sins and become a new creation in Christ. It's very powerful. So it's not a deep reach to go back to Matthew 
and say, okay, why do you have 14 here? You're organizing the chapter, no question, but is there, with the Genesis comment to introduce the paragraph, is there the thought that here is the Genesis, here is Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, who is now going to come in human form, human flesh, as a man, God and man. And this is a new creation, a new, new beginning, where God is now in human form. We've had Christophanies in the past, but now a permanent body being given to the Son of God. And as a result of this union of God with a human form, now he's in the perfect position to represent God the Father and in the perfect position to die for man, the substitute. It's very powerful. Okay. So maybe there's still mystery left with this. Maybe that's not the best explanation. You can wrestle with it yourself. But what can we see? And what is clear in this passage? I think Spurgeon has it right. He, he, as he looks at this passage, writes and quotes, I quote it, we might fancy that it yield us little spiritual food, but we may not think lightly on any line of the inspired volume. So the Bible's the most neglected book <laughs> for Christians, isn't that sad? And in the New Testament, the most neglected passages probably for consumption is Matthew 1.1 1, 1 through 17, and then Luke chapter 3, where we have a second genealogy given. Matthew's genealogy, as you study it out, is the genealogy of, this, of, of Jesus' stepfather, Joseph. The genealogy in Luke's account is the genealogy of, of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what are the odds that Mary's family line, her, her descendants, go back to, to King David? And Joseph's descendants goes back to King David. So both Joseph and Mary have a line coming from, from, from David for different sons coming down where they're direct descendants of royalty. Now, they, they weren't living in ro royal conditions. They were extremely poor. That's seen by the offering given when Jesus was born. They gave the lowest requirement that was to be given when a child was born, illustrating ab ab abject, uh, abject poverty. So what we have here is the genealogy, as you go through, of, of Joseph. And then Mary's genealogy seen in, in Luke chapter 3. Now, as we walk through the genealogy for Jews, they love genealogies. They still love genealogies. You know, for us, we probably, if we started our New Year's resolution to read through the New Testament, we probably looked at that genealogy and said, uh, <laughs> that's nice, okay, where does it end? And I'll start reading there, right? I mean, we kind of leapfrog over this saying there's not a lot of value in this, bunch of names. You know, what's the big deal? How many of you have been to the Vietnam Wall in Washington? You know, half of you. Is there someone on that wall, some name on it that you know? Some of you will say, yes, I, I have someone on my family that's on that wall. Is that name on that wall important to you? It's important to you because whose name is on the wall? Some of you have sat through high school and college graduations to, you know, you, you grew beards like uh, the guy that, didn't sleep, that slept for you know, 100 years, Rip Van Winkle. I mean, how many of you sat through a graduation service? 500 kids in the class and every name is, is mentioned. And you're sitting there and you're saying, oh, brother, this, this is just like the preacher, he's going forever, you know. <laughs> but there's one name on that bulletin. There's one name on the program and that's your grandson or your, or your daughter and it makes it all worth it when it finally comes for that one second that you probably just missed when, when, you, when your husband nudged you and say, or your wife nudged you and said, wake up, it's, she's, on the, she's on the platform. Whoa, 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 whoa. And you just, it's gone. <laughs> and you were there for two and a half hours. But it was important to you because of one name. So this genealogy is important because of all the names, but it's really important because of one name. It's Jesus Christ. And if his name's attached to it, man, I want to study it. I want to study it. So Jews love their genealogies. It's how they determine what tribe they came from. Paul was very proud of saying, Paul, uh, from the tribe of what? <laughs> Benjamin. You know, the first king was King Saul, Benjaminite. I'm from that line. You know, J Josephus is going to write in the first century. He writes, I present the descent of our family as I found it recorded in the public tablets and those who try to slander us, I wish much joy. 
Good luck, he said, trying to disprove that I'm, from, I'm a Jew and from this, this tribe. He's saying, you can't do it because I've got the genealogical records and I can prove it. And so what's happening here with this genealogy, Matthew, who's been converted, a wretched tax collector, a publican, now a new creation in Christ, he's following Jesus, and he's realizing the questions being raised throughout the land. Okay, Jesus of Nazareth, is he, how do you know he's the king of the Jews? Can you prove it? And, and one way to prove it, or at least to see if it's even an option, can you prove in any way that Jesus is a direct descendant of King David to fulfill the Davidic covenant? And Matthew is a tax collector. He has names available, rosters available. He has a temple available, piece of cake. Can you imagine how exciting it was for Matthew saying, whoa, whoa, who would ever guess Joseph goes back to, to, to Zerubbabel and goes back you know, to this person and this person and ultimately to David? Who would have ever thunk it, you know? This is just a poor guy, carpenter up in, up in, a, in what was technically the armpit uh, of Israel up there. It was, it was, it was, it was a crossroads. It was, a, it, was, it was not a real pleasant place. You know, what, good, what good thing could come out of Nazareth? You know what I mean? What good thing could come out of there? And, and you can just see Matthew going over these genealogies. And he's saying, I don't need to put all the names to prove that Jesus is a direct descendant. I just have to pick a selective number, and anyone who wants to connect the dots can go into their Old Testament and connect all they want. But I can, he, you can just see Matthew, I can give a direction. I can show from Abraham to David, David to exile, exile to Joseph, that th this is the line of a king, a royal line. That's very, very powerful. So there are four reasons, at least, that Matthew, why Matthew gave this just genealogy. And these are my original four points, and I'll just hit them briefly. First, it's important, this genealogy, for it provided a, a really good outline of the Jews' history. So if you want to study Judaism, Old Testament Israel, it's staring at you. Nice outline, really. It's a divine outline. There's three categories, three sections, three, three divisions, we could say. In verses 2 through 6a, it goes from Abraham to David. Abraham's the father, you know, of Israel. And, and there's the beginning point. And there was a covenant given to Abraham that in his seed, the world, the nations would be blessed. Seed singular, and that seed would be Jesus. And so that section there, focusing on the judges, that time period, uh, focusing on a time period with, with, later with the tabernacle, a theocracy is in view, but there's a covenant here, and what, what, David, what Matthew's very subtly doing is saying Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, he's a Jew, but he's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. So he's going to make a link there throughout the book of Matthew. Then the second generation, verses 6b through 11, is David to the Babylonian captivity. This is the scene of Israel's history, especially under David's son Solomon. They now have a temple. You now have kings, and David was the first king of the United Kingdom. Saul had some uh, sovereignty over a portion of the land, but David brought it all together, a united kingdom, and it starts with David. And it's fascinating in verse 6 what he does here. And Jesus begat David, and look at the little phrase just incidentally inserted in the central unit, the king, the king. So three units, the central unit is emphasizing the kingship of David. And why? It's the central point of the unit. He's going to connect the dot that Jesus is a direct descendant of David, the king, that makes Jesus a member of the royal line, and hence the evidence that he's Messiah and that he's king of kings and king of the Jews. So very, very powerful time of the temple. But it also there's a subtle connection to the Davidic covenant. So the first section of these 14 generations, a link to Abraham and the covenant made to him by God. And then the second unit, uh, an emphasis on David and a link to the Davidic covenant. And then, of course, the last section, last unit, last 14 generations, the nadir of their history, verses 12 through 16. Well, we go from theocracy to monarchy to, to really anarchy. Uh, this is a time where they've been judged. They go into captivity, and they have no king. 
Oh, they're going to have high priests, but they have no king, they have no temple, and Gentiles are governing over them. Wow, what do you need in view of that? You need a new covenant. You need a new covenant. And uh, Jeremiah will, will bring one forth in his sacred word. A new covenant. Ezekiel will describe a new covenant that is ratified by the blood of Jesus at the cross. So what we have here is very interesting, an outline of their history from, from, from really Abraham to its zenith with David, from David to its low point with the captivity, and then the captivity to Joseph in this case. Focus on judges to kings and then to priests. From theocracy to monarchy to hierarchy to really anarchy. So the first point, it's an important outline. It's an easy teaching point, easy to teach, easy to teach. Number two, number two. In a, in a Jewish genealogy, you would never find a woman's name listed. Like it or not, like it or not. You would not find the one woman. So if I do a genealogical study, which I like doing, man, it's husband, wife, man, that they're on equal ground, equal standing. They function differently, but my, before the cross, before Christ, on equal ground, on equal ground. No difference in Christ. So, uh, but this has very subtle additions to it. So as you read through, through the genealogy, there's going to be five women mentioned. Five women. Four are technically going to be contrasted with the last one mentioned. So where you see a woman injected into the genealogy, it's Matthew kind of putting a dig into their history. Because if you're a Jew, many would say they're very proud of their history at this point, especially first century. I'm a Jew of the tribe of whatever. And uh, they, they, they look at themselves, if I'm a biological descendant of Abraham, it's all good, right? So I'm a child of Abraham, I'm a child of God then. Biologically, it all works, right? So very, very proud. We're the privileged people, we're the people of the covenant, we're the people of the scriptures. Uh, Messiah will be a Jew. A lot of pride. So how do you humble pride, pride people, proud people? You remind them of their humanity. You remind them of their sinfulness. You remind them of, of, of their failures. And that's what Matthew's going to do. So secondly, this genealogy is important for it pierced the heart of the Jews when they really let it sink in. Look at the names. Look at the names. Uh, the names we're going to bring into it, pretty negative associations. So if I would tell you about my genealogy, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to share all the good ones. All the good names in the lineup. So um, I'm going to talk about the Mayflower. So uh, we have uh, this, the, 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 uh, the Cook family, John Cook, Sherman, uh, Francis Cook and his son John came over 1620 on the Mayflower. That's bragging rights. I'm going to tell you all about that. I've told you many, many times, nothing new. Uh, as far as we knew, perhaps inaccurately, we have two, from my mom's side, my dad's side, a signer, uh, two of the 56 signers of the declaration go back through our family tree. John Hart, I know that for a fact, uh, signed that constitution. He represented the, the colony of New Jersey. He was the only Baptist who signed, it, signed that, uh, that, that, that statement. Of the 56 signers, one Baptist, it was John Hart. And he paid a price for signing it, and he paid a price for his faith. Roger Sherman on my mom's side, it could be debated. But I'd rather not tell you about that. I'd rather brag about it and let you figure it out if it's true or not, right? Civil War heroes. So I'm William. If anyone lives south of the Mason-Dixon, east of the Mississippi in that region, just close your ears for a moment. Just for a moment, not for long. So William. My middle son's middle name is Tecumseh. My family name is Sherman, one of the names. Do I need to say any more? I'm bragging now. I'm bragging. Maybe debatable. I can brag about my great-grandfather, the musician, the editor of the Etude Music Magazine for whatever, 40-plus years. I can go on and on on really some special people in my family, right? There's a lot of good people in this Jewish line, but Matthew picks out these. What comes to your mind uh, in verse 3? And Judah begat Pharaoh, and Sarah begat Sarah of Tamar. Tamar. This is Judah. This is one of the big 12. Judah. 
What did Judah do? Judah did not keep his promise. Uh, and the way it fleshes out is Tamar knew that Judah was out in the fields with his men working, and she dressed up as a harlot. She pretended a harlot to be a harlot and enticed her father-in-law to be intimately involved with her, the result being uh, she was impregnated by Judah. And he didn't have enough money to pay for the, to pay for the service, so he gave her basically his scepter. And two, he could pay, get, go to the bank and get money out and pay her. And it comes out in the middle of all this, the mix of all this, that it was Tamar pretending to be a harlot and uh, to, to show some honor, I guess, and that Judah was incestuous and evil. Okay, Judah. It is prophetically stated that the scepter will not depart out of the hand of Judah and that tribe, yet it departs when he has an incestuous relationship with his daughter-in-law. That's really gross. Okay? That's sin. Okay. The next name, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, Wow, Rahab, is she a Jew? No, she's a Canaanite. What's even worse, she didn't pretend to be a harlot. She was one. She was one. So now in your genealogy, in your family tree, you've got a, a Canaanite harlot in the, in the mix. That, that's, woo. that's stuff you don't talk about. Don't talk about this at the dinner table. That we're related to Rahab. And then Ruth, the Rose of Moab... A Moabitess. Look at this next one in verse 5. Begat Obed of Ruth, another Gentile in the line of, of the Jewish Messiah. Well, it's almost like the Jewish Messiah has come to his own people to redeem him, but he also has an eye to Gentiles to include them in his spiritual family tree. There was a ban placed on Moabites. Deuteronomy 23, verse 3 said, uh, For ten generations uh, that the Moabites could not enter into the congregation or the worship of the Lord. And that's very interesting because if you do the math from the 1400s to the day of Ruth, that's 10 generations. <laughs> very subtle there too. The timeline had elapsed. She could enter into the worship, even legitimately. But still, a, a Moabite <laughs> and a Gentile. And then, then speaking of kings, verse 6, David the king begat Solomon. And he didn't have to add this. This is a dig. This is a poke of her that had been the wife of Uriah. David is known for his, 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 his swing, or his sling, and his fling with Bathsheba. Commits adultery, just staring at us there. Your ultimate king, the gold standard for kings, was an adulterer and a murderer. So what is he doing here? He's saying, okay, I'm presenting an outline of the history of Israel, and here are the three windows or time periods, big, big, divisions but within those divisions there's sin there is not perfection there are people who fall, fell short of the glory of God and need a savior who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth thirdly uh, in this particular genealogy for purposes of why it was written the third point here would be the obvious to protect the doctrine of the virgin birth. So you have Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba. Um, you, you've got these women mentioned here, Pro and Ruth. They were all poor in the most case, in most cases. They all lived in unusual towns or cities, unusual births related to their children. So there were some similarities, but that's where we can drop it and leave it. When you take these women, Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba, immoral. Immoral. The Bible made it very clear that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, not someone who is immoral. Someone who has the characteristic of moral integrity and purity and character. And if a woman didn't have that, she couldn't even consider herself uh, being the potential mother of Messiah as a Jewish maiden. So in contrast to, to these women who had fallen in their morality, in verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. Several things are going on in that passage. One, Mary's being introduced. At this point, when Matthew's writing, the Jews are trying to say, this Jesus is not a descendant of David. Prove it. Matthew says, easy peasy. 
here's the evidence. Okay, okay, you, you proved it, Matthew, but, but this woman, no way a virgin can conceive apart from a man and later bear a child, so she was immoral. That's, that was the word on the street, that she was immoral with another Jewish person, and the, and the larger story or narrative was that this place called Nazareth was a crossroad for Roman soldiers, and they hung out there and partied there, and it was probably a Roman soldier who got carried away and raped her. Or she was attracted to him, and that this baby, Jesus, is part Roman and part Jewish. That was the word. That's, that, what, how else do you get around it? Virgins do not conceive and have babies apart from human instruments, yeah, human, uh, human means. So what we have here is this incredible contrast being presented, but what you also have here is a list of begets through the whole genealogy. This person begets so-and-so, and this person begets so-and-so. This male begat this man through the lineup. And as you come to the end of the list, you have Eliad, he begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Methan, and Methan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, who incidentally is the husband of Mary, and you're waiting for Joseph to beget Jesus. And the lineup breaks down, it stops, that pattern stops deliberately because Joseph did not beget Jesus. He will be his stepfather, he had nothing to do with the physical birth or conception of, of Jesus. And it's interesting that what you now have is that this child is being born of Mary, feminine relative pronoun, where, where the birth is the seed of a woman, you could say. It was a virgin giving birth to a child. And that takes us all the way back to Genesis 3.15, where the seed of the woman, there would be a, a descendant of a, with a unique relationship to a woman, hinting towards a virgin birth, right there in Genesis where Jesus now is seen being born of Mary. She's not the mother of God. That's heresy. Mary is not the mother of God. Mary is the mother of Jesus, is humanity. Keep that straight. We're not adding Mary to the Godhead. We're not adding Mary to the Trinity, please. She is not the queen of heaven. She needed a savior like anyone else. In her Luke gospel, the Magnificent, she rejoiced, it says, in God, her Savior. Mary needed a Savior because Mary was a sinner. We are all sinners. But when it came to her moral integrity, she was pure, and she was the mother of Jesus, of whom was born Jesus. So this genealogy is very subtle. It's protecting the doctrine of the virgin birth and the moral integrity of Mary in this contrast. And finally, the last thought. It's important, ultimately, primarily to present Jesus as the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And what's going to happen for this book of Matthew, it's fulfillment. And although the word fulfilled isn't in this first unit, it's in the second unit and the third unit, and we'll see it over and over and over again. But what you're going to see here is this paragraph or this unit, this genealogy, is basically saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of of Abrahamic covenant, Davidic covenant, new covenant, all the way back to Genesis 3, 15 fulfillment, fulfilled, 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 and he is ultimately the king of the Jews. And that's the m picture that Matthew wants to present over and over again, that Jesus is fulfilling this, these biblical criterias because he is the king. He is a descendant of David. He's the king. So if you're a Jew, how does this genealogy impact you? How does it impact you? It's airtight. It's absolutely airtight when it comes to who Jesus was, when it comes to his royal line. You can't argue it. So now what do you need to do? You have to say, okay, I'm not going to believe it. Don't confuse me with the truth. I, you, it's airtight. Jesus is a direct descendant of David. Now what else do we know about Messiah? Well, Matthew's going to say, okay, he fulfills the genealogical or the royal line requirement, but now let's go to all these scores of prophecies that also relate to Messiah, that give you the fuller picture of his personhood, and we're going to see fulfillment, 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 fulfillment. Wow, overwhelming evidence that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be. So, 
if you believe that, that Jesus is the Son of God, you believe he was born of a virgin, you believe that he lived a perfect life to fulfill all righteousness, if you believe he died for you, and if you believe he rose from heaven, by faith then call upon him and he will save you. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and not, not of yourselves, not of works, lest we would boast, we'd brag about it, if it was by our works. We're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And when we call upon him, we become that new creature, that new person, that new creation. And, and the old life is put behind us, and there's a whole new world, a whole new life in front of us. And to show that new life, you know, obedience to baptism, very important, because that, that's a very important step of obedience. But it also, in those seven days of the new creation of the Gospel of John, leads to the seventh day, which was a marriage union. Do you know when we are placed by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, that's fantastic, that takes place at conversion, but it ultimately leads to the marriage of the Lamb. We've been given the earnest of down payment at conversion, and everything's working forward to being with Jesus Christ as, as his bride and the marriage of the Lamb which takes place in heaven. Wow, some neat themes, some neat themes. And Matthew's introducing likely a second creation theme in Christ in a similar way that John did, very subtly, but nonetheless driving us to who Jesus is and what his purpose was, was to give us a new start, a new life, a new creation, to be born anew, to be born again, to be born spiritually from above. If we do that, if we trust Christ as our Savior, then our names will be seen clearly on another document, the spiritual family tree of Jesus, called the Book of Life. And you can know that. You can know that your name is in, written in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life. Paul even recognized, because of the testimony of others, he said that these folks in the church of Philippi, their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. They're true children of God. So you can know you're a child of God. You can know by the evidence of others that they are in the family of God. And ultimately, we'll be seen, you'll see your name written down in glory, for it's yours in that Lamb's book of life. Boy, not to have that name there, to realize you blotted your name out by your unbelief, that's, that's pretty bad. Uh, I'll just share one last story about a, a list of names. So I, I like playing sports. Um, probably baseball was my better sport. Football, I played quarterback. I was okay in the earlier years. Uh, when I got into more of junior high, later junior high, senior high, I was short, fat, and chunky. And slow, didn't make a good quarterback running a triple option. Uh, but I liked football. Basketball, I was too short, really, too short, until I finally you know, stretched out a little bit. Um, but between ninth and 10th grade, I went from, I don't know, five foot six to six foot two, maybe. It was a big, big jump. Maybe five foot six, five foot seven pretty good jump, pretty gangly looking kid. I couldn't, gain a, I couldn't gain a pound. I would drink Shackley milkshakes and throw eggs into it and protein and eat like a horse. I, I couldn't gain a pound today. I look at food, I gain 10 pounds. You know, it's, it's, life is not fair. <laughs> life is not fair. And I wasn't really in good shape. I didn't play football for the first time in like, I don't know, six, seven years. So I didn't have football conditioning going into basketball tryouts. I hadn't been playing much. You can just envision me. I'm in 10th grade, long hair down to my shoulders, part of the middle. I was adorable. Complexion broke out everywhere. I went through cases of Clearasil. I mean, cases. We bought it by, by sh shipping containers. So um, it, was, it was pretty ugly, pretty ugly. And I remember trying out for basketball. I didn't start, you know, normally in, the, in, in middle school, junior high. I was always number two, number two pastor, number two basketball player. In fact, I wrote a poem, number two. I'm always number two. And uh, so um, I didn't show real good, uh, didn't show out real good in, in basketball uh, tryouts, but I, I knew I was on the team. I knew I was on the team. I might not look good, and I'm not going to maybe start, but I'm on the team, you know. Always been on the team. And so uh, the day that the coach said, when, you know, I'll post the lineup, all the names of the guys on the team, and you come down and see if your name's on it, and then we'll have practice that night. So I went down to the gym. I don't know, I don't know why I wasted any time. I knew I was on the team. Went down to the gym on those little glass, those windows of all the metal things in it, you know, like chicken wire, <laughs> safety, safety. So I go down there, Bob Coffin. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, well, Dave Brown. Yeah, that makes sense. Jeb Burton Cini. Yeah, yeah, Jeb's really good. He'll, he'll start. I went right down all those names, 12 names. My name wasn't there. <laughs> 
I said, I need to look at it again, and maybe it's in finer print. <laughs> it wasn't there. You know, the coach is missing this genius, this incredible potential. I was not on that roster. I, I went away from that devastated. I didn't want to ever try out again. I didn't ever want to face rejection again. I, I, I'd played all those years and whatever, 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 man, I wasn't on the lineup. And Michael Jordan hadn't, hadn't been rejected yet in his high school years. I, hadn't, I didn't have that example to lean into. You know, you know Michael Jordan, they cut, they cut me. They might cut Michael, same thing. But it was really empty feeling. To go home on the bus <laughs> when I should have stayed at the gym, devastating. How much more so when a soul of a man or a woman, a person dies, <laughs> and they think at the moment of death that they're going to go to heaven. They know it. They're looking forward to it because they were a Sunday school teacher. They were a deacon. They, they taught in his name. They gave money to the church. They were benevolent people, good neighbors, bought Girl Scout cookies. I mean, the whole deal. And then all of a sudden at death, they realize, I'm not in heaven, but I'm in hell. I'm in utter darkness. I'm in hell. And, of course, the question is, you know, Lord, why? What, what's, what's wrong? And the Lord says, your name's not written in the book. And he says to that individual, I never knew you. I never knew you. You never trusted me by faith alone for salvation. You were resting upon your laurels. You were, you were resting upon your works. You thought all your good deeds and good behavior would save your soul. And that's not how anyone is ever saved. You're only saved by the grace of God through faith and what Jesus did, his finished work on the cross where he died, shed his precious blood, rose from that grave. It's only through Jesus he's the way. It's only through Jesus he's the door. It's only through Jesus he's the resurrection. It's only through Jesus he's the bread of life. It's only through Jesus. There's, I think, many people who think they're in good standing with God because they have a life of works, but have never been born again, never been justified by faith. And at death they die and they're in hell and they finally realize I rejected the only way to heaven for Jesus Christ. I think there are people, I hate to say this, in our type of church that have heard the Bible for generations, decades, who are, who are lost people. And I, I just think our type of churches, we have some that are just lost people who are not, they don't have a real relationship of God for faith in Jesus Christ. And I think the surprise, and when we get, all get to heaven, is you know those who do know the Lord, is I think we're going to be surprised with some who will be there, saying, "Whoa, I wouldn't have expected that." Lot, really, I wasn't expecting you to be here, Lot. Really, but his righteous soul was vexed. Okay, he saved. Lot's in heaven. Okay, didn't didn't expect that. But I think there's also going to be the surprise when we look around heaven's you know majesty and we say, "Where's my neighbor? Where's my friend I sat with at church? Where is so and so?" And you look, and you ask. And uh, if we have access to the Lamb's Book of Life, we look at the names, like I looked on the gym wall, the door, the window, and their name's not there because they blotted it out by their unbelief. Wow. I think we have some surprises ahead of us. Everyone who's talking about going to heaven ain't going. It's just that simple. So I like what Paul says. He says, examine yourself whether ye be in the faith of or not. May the Holy Spirit allow us to examine ourselves. Are we truly a child of God? Have we been born into his family through faith alone in his finished work? For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Let's bow for prayer. This morning the genealogy presents Christ Jesus as the King, Scripture fulfilled. Now he wants us to be spiritually fulfilled. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to know him. He wants us to be given a new life. He wants to declare us righteous through faith. This morning, if you have any doubt about your salvation, don't play any games of your eternal soul. Don't play any games. Is there someone here I could pray for where you would just say, Pastor, I, I may be one of those where I might be surprised when I die. I may not be with the Lord. I just have a lot of... <laughs> doubt on this if I have really ever trusted Christ would you pray for me that I would find biblical assurance 
in Christ for my salvation. Would you pray for me? Is there someone I could pray for this morning? Yes, someone else this morning I could pray for. Someone else this morning. Would you this morning take a moment, right where you're sitting, and saying, Lord, I want to know. I want to know that I have eternal life. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power or the authority to become the sons of God. So with childlike faith, we turn from our sin and we just cry out from our heart to his heart, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. So that's, that's simple. We're in faith just saying, you're the only way. You're the only one. I, I call upon you now. Would you save me, Lord? Please, Lord, be merciful to me. I want to know. I don't want to live with doubt. I don't want to live with fear. That's not God's desire for any of us. He has not given us a spirit of fear. There should be no fear of death for us. Is there anyone else I could pray for? Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Thank you for this amazing gospel that Matthew's penned. How he must have been so encouraged and rewarded and assured when he saw this document and those records before him as he put together the lineup that Jesus of Nazareth goes right back to King David's line. Lord, that must have been such a blessing to see and to be able to share it with millions now. Lord, I pray for anyone here that uh, doubts their salvation, who's struggling, who is fearful that you might say to them, I never knew you. Oh, Lord, may we have folks that are genuine and honest and transparent. Blessed we heard that are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, may people turn to you in faith, calling upon you, trusting you alone for salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Nathan, if you'd come and close our service.